Are you tired of content about the Book of Common Prayer in the daily office yet? Well, if you are, this video might not be the one that you are so chucking and jiving with, but I'm having a conversation with my friend Joshua Tepper, a longtime buddy, went to seminary together, one of my best friends. We podcasted together for years, had a podcast called The Threshing Floor. Uh, it's, it's, we haven't had do, done a new episode in ages, but it's still on the internet, so I'll link that down below. But we talk about the daily office, we talk about the devotional life, all those sorts of things inside of this conversation, and I want to share it with you. Last thing before we pop into it, are you signed up to get my Monday morning email yet? I send it out every Monday at six o'clock in the morning, and it's about pop culture, uh, theology, music, uh, cultural events, that sort of thing. But it's seven great links, and I would love to send it to you, and you can get that link in the description below. But let's jump into this conversation with my best friend, Joshua Tepper, and he convinced me to buy a new book of common prayer in this conversation. So we'll get straight to it. So we've done a bunch of videos with the Daily Office. So by now it's not a secret that I love the Daily Office, but I'm a Daily Office uh, amateur. I've talked about this, I've said before, that I just don't do with the whole like nine yards. Anyway, this is my friend, Reverend Joshua Tapper. Hey y'all. Joshua's an Anglican priest. That's true. And so that means he's actually from the tradition that like the office is the thing. We've been good buds for years. He used to have a podcast called The Threshing Floor. He's been here for the weekend. And like we had this really cool conversation about the prayer book the first night he got here. But we've been talking about the prayer book and devotional life, all those sorts of things for the last weekend. And I was like, let's just, I just want to get Joshua here and just us to have a conversation about the daily office, about the Book of Common Prayer, about just the devotional life and just kind of the more rhythmic appreciation to it. So, What's up, buddy? Hey, man. Good to be with you. Good to be here talking about the BCP. It's one of my uh, yeah. favorite things to talk about just because I think it's has uh, it's such a powerful tool that so often we don't use. Yeah. Um, and I, it's it honestly, at this point, it's the number one tool I encourage people that want to develop a devotional life. Uh, that w for the t number one tool for them to use is yeah. the, the Book of Common Prayer, because I just think it's a super easy introduction to developing a robust uh, spirituality and devotional life that's centered on Scripture. Yeah, and, prayer. and I think that's the thing is you know, we've talked about this before, but like the office, like it seems to be that bridge between like Jesus calling and not using anything and just throwing yourself super super deep into Scripture. Yep, where I was for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then I've kind of slowly, over the last four years or so, backpedaled into the daily office, but not necessarily, like, I know what I'm calling the daily office and what you're calling the daily office are two separate things. Yeah. Yeah. And I think here's, here's what, because I think that, um, though I'm not a huge fan of things like Jesus Calling, you know, if that's where you are, like, that's awesome and don't stop that. But, like, I feel like that the Lord is inviting us into a deeper space than that. So though like devotionals can be really helpful and good, I think they are a starting point and we got to progress from there. Like if we get into the model of just like consuming devotional material after devotional material after devotional material, I think we we're missing the point and in some sense is arrested in development. Yeah. So I think the Lord is inviting us into something deeper. And what I love about the book of common prayer is that it can be that next step. And also it can be a step that you can continually and consistently go back to. Yeah. One of the things that that um, a professor we both had, Robert Stamps, uh, used to say, he said, I, I love the BCP because whenever I use it, I always want to pray more. And so for me, it's it's such a foundational first step in my devotional life. So even when I have when I've seasons when I've had a much more robust devotional life, it's always been the step. Like I pray the prayers to then pray prayers. But at, in seasons when my devotional life has been um, it's been struggling or life has gotten busy or just for whatever reason it's been not as, as as robust as it could be or should be, the Book of Common Prayer has been a anchor for me to hold on to. And I, I think that's what the BCP in its essence represents for me so much is it gives me scripture and prayer at, to pray when I don't necessarily know what else to pray or what else to read or what else to, to, to think. Like it gives me a rubric that has been tried and true for 500, 600 years that immerses me in scripture. Cause that's the thing about it, Chad. Like 
Like some people are like, I don't want to pray rogue prayers, you know, prayers that someone else has written. I want to pray my own prayers. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's a definitely a, 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 an, a, an ambition. But the thing about the BCP is that 95% of it, even its prayers are just scr scripture. straight scripture. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're literally learning to breathe in and breathe out, pray in and pray out the very words of the text in a curated fashion that helps, I think, bring stability when things are shaking. And it also helps to create a foundation that you can build upon for, for greater depths and greater levels of, of devotional life. Um, and I think what's interesting, you said that, that, um, you know, for people who say, I don't want to pray somebody else's prayers, that whole nine yards. And if this just being scripture, it's almost as though the prayer book bleeds the lines between some sort of because like, I would agree wholeheartedly that scripture and prayer are almost like completely intermingled. Yeah, I mean, you can, and where does one begin and the other where, end? And, and that's yeah, and like I know I back in my own my own devotional life that there's times and stuff where I'm, it's almost like I'm drifting in and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I think some of it might be, you know, some people say they struggle with scripture and they don't struggle with prayer, or people say they struggle with prayer and don't struggle with scripture. But I think how many times there are a situation where in our own devotional life, no, we actually struggle with both. Yeah. And the idea of, I don't want to pray someone else's prayers is actually some sort of weird self-defense mechanism to, I don't know how to pray. I think that's absolutely right. And also I think that is assuming that someone is in a decent place because here's the reality when your life gets rocked by something bad happening, pain, death, yeah. um, you know, mental health instability, uh, a hard church situation, sometimes you just don't have words. You don't yeah. have prayers. And what we and so know, often you, you do know, is we just them. don't pray. Yeah. But yeah. this, the Book of Common Prayer, gives me prayer, gives me words to pray when I don't know what to And it pray. anchors into it. And it anchors me in the scriptures, in the life of God, in a tried and true vein of spirituality that has produced some of the greatest Christians that have ever walked the face of this earth. And what's so interesting is, you know, and I'm just now realizing this, all of our conversations over the last few days about the prayer book and about the devotional life. I'm looking at the daily office as a scripture reading plan. Mm -hmm. You were seeing it as a pattern of prayer. Yes. Yes. But to me, the two aren't necessarily even... They're not even disconnected. Yeah, they're not disconnected. They're, they're, they're in there. Because the in my mind, like I think far too often we make scripture study into an academic enterprise. Yeah. And that's good and necessary and helpful, and especially in the pastoral vocation. But if I'm talking to the folks that aren't in ministry, my number one goal is not to get them into scripture study for education. My number one goal is to get them into scripture study for formation. formation. And I think that's what the BCP yeah. does. Read the scripture for transformation. So things like Lectio Divina, some of those older models where like you're really reading the text to encounter the presence of the risen Christ, um, I think that's critically important and sometimes lost. Yeah. And I think what the BCP does is kind of act as a springboard into that. Into, yeah. So it's all, you know, like, you know, Pete Gregg had his book that came out a couple years ago, How to Pray. Mm -hmm. And he has his whole P-R-A-Y mechanism mm -hmm. of pray, of uh, what, uh, pause, rejoice, um, ask, and yield. Yep. And like the prayer book, it gives us a form because that's the thing is I think that, you know, if, we, if, we frustrate, if we're frustrated with the stale prayer life, so many times I feel like our beginning points in prayer is the asking piece. Mm -hmm. And because if the average person just says, I need to pray, what is it? Hey, God, give me this. Yeah. Hey, God, save me from this. Hey, God, rescue me from this. It, it, it can be self-reference. Yeah. It, 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 so. Yeah. And I, I think you could do, we could, we could talk about the whole self-reference thing, but I think also a lot of it is that doesn't teach us to pray. No. And that, that we we lose. I, can, I can't think of the book title right now. I feel like it's a, a, like one of those Tozer works, but this is about experiencing fruit through prayer, or, or it's one of those old kind of classic devotional things. Mm -hmm. That's it. So, like, how, why do you think, or how do you think? Because I mean, you're also like doing a PhD in Wesley studies, and so some of this stuff is just you're around this kind of uh, this larger Episcopal Anglican Church of England tradition. Sure, yeah. So, like, why do you think it's the the prayer book? is the thing that has been like the most grabbed upon part of the larger Anglican communion in history? I think that's a couple of reasons. Um, first off, I think it's beautiful. Uh -huh. um, and I think that, and I, and I don't want 
people to dismiss that because it's like, oh yeah, that's silly. But no, I think re beauty resonates with our souls. You know, like I love the, what is the Dostoevsky saying? That beauty will save the world. Yeah. Like there's some things in the BCP that are just simply beautiful. The way that they even render some of the scripture translations. Like I love Psalm 95, which is the Venet in the, in the ancient liturgies. It's come let us, at the end of it says, come let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his mind. Oh, that today, the sheep of his hand, excuse me. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Like you say that every day for three weeks. You begin believing and that. And yeah, and like then that this idea of the, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand, it begins to shape and form you. And the beauty of the language begins to invite you into this, into this journey. Um, and so I think beauty is, 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 is one of the main reasons it's had such powerful effect for so many. But well, also I think just the, the ordering of how it is. Like every day you, 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 you open up with acknowledging God. Then you pray for forgiveness for your sin. You confess it. Like how powerful is that in our day and, world, day and age when you confess your own sin every day? Yeah. They say that's what threw me. Like We were talking about this earlier, and I've said it on a video too. Like I... In the last couple of months, I've moved from, like, I would use the daily office readings, and then I would do the 24-7 prayer uh, app. Mm -hmm. And I've moved into also including in, well, let's call it the baby office, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the little field guide for daily sure, prayer. Sure. Yeah. Because I say, I need confession in my life every day. There's something about, like, our world needs to confess, yep. and so I will confess. And then the beautiful thing is that it's not, it's, it's confession too, but it's also absolution. It's forgiveness. Yeah. Like, it, it, and, and I just do this normally by myself. And, like, it's best done, actually, with two or three people. But um, a lot of times I'll just do it uh, by, with myself and the Lord. But, like, I pray a prayer that says, Almighty God, have mercy on me. Forgive me all my sins. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen me all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep me in eternal life. So I've confessed my sins, but then there's also forgiveness. Yeah. Like, how powerful is it to every day remind yourself, not only have I sinned, but God forgives me. And it throws you into comprehending sin on a daily basis. Yes. Because, and a lot of people will accuse, you know, Christian faith, especially... Um, We've whitewashed the idea of we've taken sin outside of faith development. Mm -hmm. We don't want to talk about our sin. And there's, I mean, we could go off, me and you could have a, a fantastic conversation. I got a lot of thoughts on sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah about harmatology in the modern church, all that. But like just to be confronted with that confession piece every day, it's like, okay, no, I have sin in my life. Yes. And it's, it's only when we can acknowledge that we are broken can we truly receive the forgiveness of God. And then it also begins to shape and form us to when we are sinned against, that we can then show forgiveness to others in true Christian in true Christian unity and yeah. and reconciliation. Yeah. Um, it's forming you in ways that it's that are so deep and especially and this is the thing I tell people and this is another reason I think it's been such a powerful tool over the years is that like there is power in in the routine and the rogueness and the rut of doing the same rubric for prayer every day like it begins to perform deep ruts in your life that where forgiveness is just naturally yeah. what you do and tell that rut story you told me yeah I'll, i've never heard that before i'll give it credit it was from lawson stone a professor at asbury and he talks about how uh the the word rut comes from the root of the word routinization or routine and and and, it, and he he gave this analogy that it's kind of like when the settlers were moving from the east coast of the united states to to explore the west and to go to the gold mines and to do all the things that they did out west and what they would the, the later settlers would do is there would be such in ground um there was ruts in the roots. ruts in the road yeah from the from the wagons going in the same direction that when they would get on the path to leave home they would just pop their animal that was was pulling their um their wagon into these well-worn um, ruts in the road and they could, the, the animal would just know to go straight and follow the rut. And then they could have a life and their while wheels, they were traveling. And, and their wheels are stuck in the yes, ruts. Yes, their wheels are stuck in the ruts. 
and they would be able to do things like have dinner, engage uh, with neighbors, and like have still engage in life while they were on their way to to the West. And and it's this idea that maybe rut and routine isn't so bad. Maybe it's a well worn path that helps us get where we're going. Um, that has shaped and formed us and keep us on the straight and narrow. Yeah. Um, but it's I, not it's not sexy in our no. culture for that. And I remember I was talking to a friend of mine, Jennifer Clark. You would you would love to meet Jennifer. Um, she's doing a she's doing a demon right now. I think at George Fox mm-hmm. in spiritual formation, and she's uh, she she teaches uh, speech pathology. Okay. At a college, and cool. she her and her husband are the stewards of a Christian camp up in North Louisiana that. Like, it's had all sorts of crazy Holy Spirit, like, cool stuff. I, Lauren Daigle received a prophetic call as, like, an 11-year-old at this camp. Oh, cool. By a blind woman. Wow. Yeah. All this kind of a thing. But Jennifer, um, me and her talked a lot about during early and mid-COVID in 2020, like, how much the office was an anchoring presence for us in our life. And whereas I was, the daily office is mine. She's, she's doing your whole flippity flip. Yeah, yeah. Or as you put it the other night, the dealer's choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that's the thing of it too. It's like most people have the, the idea like, oh, I don't want to pray the same prayers. And, and I'll be honest, like if, if your spirituality is only ever praying other people's prayers, you probably need to be kicked in the butt a little bit and yeah. be pushed out of the nest. But I also think that if all you are ever doing is praying your own prayers, you can fall into the same ruts and patterns and it can become so self-referenced and then well, eventually I think that loses stain. It's just almost as you though, stop praying. It's almost so like you talk about like there's the ruts that move you to this new place. Yeah. But then your own ruts and routines that staying completely self-referenced drive yep. you into. And they can actually deform it you. It is. So, so imagine like, you know, you've got a one or two degree offset of where you need to be. doesn't sound like a big deal on day mm-hmm. one, but on day like 500, you're so far off track. And it's this honest, unintentional self-referencing Yeah, that so many of us, and I think in Western culture and that, you know, the Western church in the last 100 years, I don't think we realize that that one degree of self-referencing, like um, Alexander uh, Taco talked about this and he wrote a book. He came to America in the, like, r- right after the Revolutionary War, I think, mm-hmm. to understand what, 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 is, what is American exceptionalism. And what uh, Tocqueville found out, and he said, was the thing that makes America so astounding will also be its downfall, and it's her fierce commitment to individualism. Yeah. And if left unchecked, what will happen? And he had some sociologists came back and asked himself some questions based off of his work in the 1980s, and they're yeah. like, yeah, it's never been chucked. And then now 40 years later, let's just look at where the church is. Exactly. And that's that, that piece of, that's the thing, is where I'm finding myself drawn more and more and more into like the prayer book tradition is that intentional alignment with something that's not me. Yes. And and to continue answering your question, I think that's another reason the prayer book has been so successful um, is because it's actually helpful in forming you in a collective um, spirituality. Like it's powerful even existentially to think that there are literally millions of people praying the same way with me every day. Yeah. And it's been tested and true to be helpful for growth and spirituality, for uh, for helpful in growing godly in Christ Jesus, and and so I think that so yeah, it's beautiful, but also like it's helpful, yeah. and and for me, I think of it like this, like it's always it's like jumping on a trampoline. Like I can jump on the ground and I'm not going to get super far, but if I jump on a trampoline, I've got a much bigger, I've got a much better spring to get where I want to yeah. go. And I think that BCP is a is a really good springboard into the deeper things of spirituality. Yeah. So for me, I always pray it and then I lead myself into doing Lectio Divina and then lead myself into doing the uh, Ignatian spirituality. And those three things together form for me a robust spirituality yeah. that allows me to engage in the scriptures, engage in prayer, pray for others, but also give myself the space for the spirit to speak to me for transformation. But none of that's possible without the springboard. So let's do, so let's do this. Let's let's kind of transition now into the second conversation we've been having all weekend. Is just that power and the necessity of a devotional life. Oh yeah. And the things like if we don't have like one of the conversations we've had this weekend is like Christianity devoid of a devotional life easily deforms into something yeah. that is a I mean the lack of a better term is a bastard version of yeah. Christianity. On both sides of the I mean I'm from also. from a from a, a, a traditionalistic orthodox perspective, but then also from a uh, a, a like mainline Protestant liberalism 
or a progressive Christianity, which I think are two different things now in I our agree. world now, that when you don't have, regardless of where you fall on this spectrum, the absence of devotional life devoids you of spiritual power. 100%. I mean, I'm so bold as to say to my congregation at this point that if you don't have a consistent devotional life that, go, that roots you in Scripture and prayer, I'm not going to say every day, but I'm going to say most days. Yeah. If you don't have that, you will not grow mature in Christ Jesus. You will be forever a babe. Yeah. And and, and that's just like I'm so convinced of that. That one yeah. to one. I don't care what. I don't care if you're a pastor. I don't care if you're a lay leader. I don't care what board you're on, where you teach seminary or gra graduate school. If you do not have a consistent devotional life, I I do not think you can be mature in Christ. Well, in some ways, though, like you know, in some ways, you are a babe in faith. Yeah. And like, you know, you're Anglican, we both went to Asbury, I'm Methodist. Like we talk about the role of experience mm -hmm. in Christian life and how it drives and these sorts of things. And like to think, like, how do you, if we believe what Jesus said is to be true, and we've talked about that this weekend, how do you live these ideals and do these things and try to, to channel the power of, of the triune God, but have never channel that and found that deeply personal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and then something like you talked about, I'll let you kind of riff on this for a while because this is your area of expertise, but the idea of always converting or, yeah. always, or a constant conversion. And that's and so that's becoming something that I'm, I'm realizing in my research, um, but also something I've experienced in my own life and especially in our tradition of, um, you know, Wesleyan spirituality, but also for me, Pentecostal and charismatic uh, life is that there is this sense that you're always seek, you're always seeking to experience the presence of God. And, and I never knew what that was as a young man uh, seeking it. I just knew I wanted it. But as I've grown and as I've researched, I've realized that it is a continual process of posturing yourself before the Lord to have him transform your life. Uh, and I, I really love the story from... Um, Metropolitan Callistos Ware, who's the Orthodox Metropolitan in England, he just passed away this year, rest in peace. Um, but what he said, somebody randomly asked him on the London Tube, they said, they said, because uh, they, you know, they were being good evangelicals, and I respect this, um, but they said it to the wrong guy. Um, they said, uh, are, um, are you saved? Because they, they saw him as big beard and and his, his, his orthodox garb, and he looked at them in only the way Callistos Ware could, and he said, I was saved uh, in 33, day, uh, 33 AD, I am saved, and I'm being saved. And that understanding, that's appalling understanding. Yeah. Paul talked about the salvation process as being a continual process. And, and I think the Lord is inviting us in that space to always being converted, and, and that looks like a process of, of entire transformation through our whole lives, but it requires us not only to have these deep momentary experiences with God, which I think are critical and are unfortunately under assault in a lot of our churches as being no longer helpful or being manipulative. I disagree with that. They're still incredibly necessary, the momentary experience with the presence of God, but it has to be followed up with a consistent and daily posturing of ourselves before the Lord. Otherwise, those moments will just be that. Moments. It's like the Lord does the work, and then we are called to cultivate the work in daily devotional life. Yeah. And if we don't, then we're just leaving what the Lord has done fallow, un untilled, and it's ultimately gonna to, it's gonna uh, waste away, and, yeah. and 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 we're gonna have to start the process all well, over. And again, it's hopefully. you know I go back and I think it's in oh I think it's in Genesis. I talked about it in a video the last couple weeks ago, but and I never heard about it or thought about it this way, and I started seeing it with these 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 ministers and these churches now that are being very conscious to seek to think about revival. They begin pointing back to that passage in uh -huh. Genesis where they're redigging the wells of the fathers. Yeah. Yeah. And to think back, like the prayer book is putting us into the same de formational devotional pattern, not just of ourselves. But we talked about how when you were in England a couple months back, you found uh, an old prayer book that Wesley would have used, mm -hmm. not his exact copy, but yeah, like that that's been the. Cool, but no, just that same, same. You wouldn't have got it. For same edition. You wouldn't have got it for a hundred bucks if it was Mr. Wesley's prayer book. No, unfortunately. <laughs> but like that's like, hey, this is the prayer book that Wesley and his preachers would have been using. Yeah. And, and it's like that. It connects so. And I know some people, if they're still watching this and they're thinking this, I'm blown away. They're still watching this, but they might be saying like, hey, um, I don't need 
this book of common prayer to have a good life with Jesus. Do you? No. True. Absolutely not. But to have a 500-year-old proven tool to be inside of the presence of God, who would not want that? Exactly. And here's the thing. Tool is the right word, Chad. I'm sure each of us, and for all the people that have a tool chest or do work in their home, will resonate with, we all have tools that we maybe only use for one or two jobs. But if you don't have that tool, it's going to be, a, you, can you get it done another way? Absolutely. But it's going to be really hard. Yep. And this is a tool that has, I think, a very specific purpose that is really helpful for springboarding a devotional life and also for building a foundation for a robust devotional life. And that's what I use it for. Do I need it? Do I need to have it for that? To, to have a, a springboard when I'm feeling dry and to have a, a, a solid foundation to build upon? No. But is it a good tool for that? Absolutely. And it has proven for hundreds of years to be faithful in that. And it's proven that in my own life. And if you are Wesleyan Methodist, I'll say this. Wesley said the number one tool in his devotional life that springboarded his entire Methodist ministry was the Book of Common yeah. Prayer. And I also like how... Just take Wesley's advice. Yeah, just take Mr. Wesley. I mean, you, yeah, for, for two Wesleyans, we're not going to argue with Mr. Wesley's advice. I rarely yeah. do. I mean, also you think about this, like you've got this tool to also, for churches that might be in a more free church tradition, and they're trying to think, how do I cause greater spiritual formation? Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find programs, boom, 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 this kind of thing, this kind of thing, this kind of thing. This is a way, and I think a lot of folks, sometimes people have, have said to me, they're like, Chad, you're not Episcopal. Why are you using this Episcopal thing? And I was like, I don't really think about that. But also, like, you know, if you're in a smaller group of people and you want to begin seeking God together, what are the practical, pragmatic ways to do this? You said it earlier. This is actually designed to be done in a group. In a group. Yeah. And here's the reality, too, about that whole, like, you're, you're not Episcopal. Why use that? It's like, come on, y'all. Like, your parishioners are probably going to be reading Charles Stanley's devotional book. And trust me, that's not denominational, denominationally or theologically aligned yeah. either. Yeah. So, like, I mean, I just think that's kind of a red herring to kind of draw those denominational pit lines, yeah. you know? Yeah. Which, sadly, um, a lot of people now, they think that's their foundation. Is, yeah. Is stuff, that's just, so. uh, Tim, I'm sorry. I think yeah. that's silly. No offense, but kind of offense. Oh, I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, trust me. I'm a little shady here. I'll get the, 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 the channel gets a little, a little shady. So let's finish off with this and let's laugh about it because at the end of this 20 minute conversation and dare, it ended up in me ordering a new prayer book. Yes, it did. With your, yes, it did. Like, your, your, your yeah. white whale so, that you have here. So if your followers have followed you for any length of time, they know that Chad's pretty fascinated with Bibles and finding the right Bible and spending an inordinate amount of time looking for the right Bible. Well, I've also spent a good amount of time looking for the right Bible, but I've spent as much time, if not more, looking for the right Book of Common Prayer. And I look over, and Chad is still using this little thing. And if any of our readers are under the age of uh, 30, this might work for them. But for any over the age of 30, um, I was like, Chad, I don't know how you read that, buddy. Um, but I convinced him that he needed this lovely reader's edition printed by Oxford, which, if you're listening, Oxford folks, would you please reprint this? And would you please send me some copies? and I'll wrap them again and make it yes in hardback yes and make it in hardback again but we but I've been I, I had about an eight year search to look for this size BCP made by the right Oxford Publishing House which makes a quality book yeah um, and I finally found it last year uh, and well, I and Chad's like well I'm gonna find the hardback I was like no you're not so hold on a second so you <laughs> looked, okay so you you got this back at Asbury years yes, ago yes in 2010 so your your eight year search culminated in the leather version that yes. I ordered yes that okay. is correct okay that is correct and uh, I mean I've looked high and low and you'll you can go you think you're now all some of our listeners are gonna go on eBay and be like oh, I just found the hardback no you didn't you found a version of the hardback that's not the same that's a smaller type font but um but it was a long search that I finally found. Um, one seller who sells the right size type font in the Oxford um, binding, um, but it's not hardback. It's leather, it's bound, leather. which is a lovely, beautiful it's, version. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I own one now too, so I have two of this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put a link to that in the description for people who want to investigate know. that. Just, I don't want them to run out. What if I need another? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you know, I'm surprised you don't have four in a box. I am thinking about it because me and you think the same. Yeah, it's like we like it when we get six of them, so I always have a lifetime. <laughs> exactly. Supply. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let him put that link, y'all. But yeah. but know that if it runs out, I'm not gonna be happy. 
and you better put it on eBay if you don't use it. Because <laughs> I'll buy it. <laughs> well, Joshua, I know that, like I said, I, I, I told you this morning, I said, hey, let's, let's kind of have a rehashing of our prayer book conversation. We might have to have Joshua come back at a later date to uh, explain the whole prayer book process. Yeah, you know, and that's I, I think that would be fun because I think for if, if for those that don't haven't used it too much, it can be intimidating. But like I was telling Chad, it's really not. Like they actually give you the directions inside the Book of Common Prayer and with like a 20 or 30 minute intro by someone who knows how to use it, you can use it for life. And it's and it is it's not monotonous in that fact because there's a lot of options that you can pray. And I just do it in ways where I'm never praying the same thing more than once a week. Dealer's choice. Dealer's choice. Dealer's choice. <laughs> but certain seasons, I'm like, you know what? I want to pray the Magnificat every day because I want to remind myself that at the end of the day, the Lord is going to tear down systems of wickedness and I need that for my soul. So I'll read that every day for a week. Dealer's choice. I can do that if I want. <laughs> so we, I, how about this? What I'll do is I'm going to experiment for a month on my own. Mm-hmm. See if I can figure it out. And then I'll call you and I'll say, okay, this I figured out. Am I doing, am I, am I getting this down into the Sounds whole thing? Sounds like a plan. So it's good. So Joshua, thank you for coming on YouTube channel. I almost, like, I almost like, like we threshing forward for years together. So we... Sold hat. We, yeah, we know we know how to have a recorded conversation. Sold hat. So yeah. that's it. But uh, man, thanks for coming on YouTube. Oh man, video. so fun. Thanks for having me. <laughs>